we are not alone. And we have a precious guide with us at all times. But her love is unconditional. And that love is severity and mercy. We receive both from her. And when we receive one or the other, we should do so with gratitude, with humility, with love, recognition, remembrance. Remember your Divine Mother. If you remember your Divine Mother, your life will become easier from the standpoint of you will no longer entertain thoughts of victimhood and you will no longer entertain thoughts of self-sabotaging behaviors, namely addictions of every kind, self-destructive addictions, right? So you hate yourself so much, you can't stand to be with yourself. So you, you, you medicate yourself with whatever it is, whatever addiction is going to get you to forget yourself. Well, you can see how remembering your Divine Mother is the antithesis of that. Be in love with your Divine Mother. Now, what do we mean by that? Can we give you examples of that? Yes, we can. Surely you've heard of Rumi. It's an interesting quote. We just picked this randomly. We just needed a picture of Rumi. What's interesting that's left out of this quote is that the things that we see are all courtesy of our Divine Mother. That's the light in her hand, the light of Lucifer, for example, that, that shines a light on our defects and vices. But everything that we see is our Divine Mother, is the Divine Feminine. Rumi is the poet of love. He's the Sufi poet of love. But what a lot of people don't realize is that 99% of Rumi's love poetry is to his Divine Mother. He's not writing to a lover. He's writing to his Divine Mother, the Divine Feminine. And if you read his poems in that context, they reveal themselves to you in a way that it all becomes a meditation. It all becomes scripture. The poet of love is expressing his love for his Divine Mother. That's Rumi. That's the first example we can give you. Another example, perhaps you remember watching this film. Have you seen it? It's an excellent film. It's about Beethoven. It's called Immortal Beloved. And the whole film, it's a whodunit. It's a mystery because they find all these letters that, that Beethoven wrote to his immortal beloved. And there's this detective-like character who's trying to figure out who was Beethoven's immortal beloved. And here you see three candidates, three of, of uh, Beethoven's lovers that he had in his lifetime. And this detective is trying to figure out because Beethoven wrote these, these incredible letters of devotion, of loving devotion to his immortal beloved. And they're trying to figure out who was Beethoven's immortal beloved. And this is where the movie falls flat on its face and, and everything else. Because, of course, Beethoven's immortal beloved was his divine mother. None of these women, none of the women in the movie, is, is his immortal beloved is his divine mother, his muse, the one who inspired all of his music, including the Ninth Symphony, which is the greatest piece of music ever written. And it's the Ninth Symphony because the Ninth Sphere on the Tree of Life is Yasad, the foundation. That's where Divine Mother Devi Kundalini Shakti resides within us, in the Ninth Sphere on the Tree of Life. So it's fitting that the greatest symphony ever written, and including the fourth movement and the ode to joy an ode to joy now an ode is a particular poem of loving devotion and of glorification it's a poem of uplifting of illuminating of of honoring of complete loving devotion so for example john keats ode on a grecian urn that's what an ode is, a complete pouring out of one's loving devotion to a phenomenon, but that phenomenon is always feminine. An urn is a vase, is a vessel, like a grail, like a cup, like the uterus of a woman, like a womb, like an ark, like a seed pod. That is the very nature of the feminine. The feminine contains, it is the medium of, of experience and of wisdom. 
That's why Sophia, wisdom, is Sophia, a woman's name. She's feminine. Wisdom is feminine because wisdom is born of experience and experience is born of the union of masculine and feminine. But that masculine experiences through the feminine and in the feminine and creates within and through the feminine. Beethoven's immortal beloved is his divine mother. And when you listen to the Ninth Symphony and when you read the lyrics of the Ode to Joy as they are being sung and you realize who the Ninth Symphony is for and about, then you'll be like, oh, that makes complete sense. Can we give you any other examples? Yes, of course. Of course we can. Perhaps the most famous of all women in art, certainly in the West, we present to you the Mona Lisa. If you've ever seen the Mona Lisa in the Louvre, you know that the Mona Lisa is like this big. It's tiny. She's, they always manage to make the painting look enormous somehow. But when you see it in a frame in real life in the Louvre, it's, it's tiny. And that's because Leonardo da Vinci, the artist, of course, who created the Mona Lisa, he took the Mona Lisa with him everywhere he went. And he traveled a lot because he had many patrons because he was a Renaissance man. He was a painter. He was an engineer. He was an, an architect. Well, you should know all this about uh, da Vinci. But what you might not know is that Mona Lisa is an anagram. It's a thinly, thinly veiled anagram. And during his life, wealthy merchant bankers of Italy offered da Vinci the equivalent of hundreds of millions of dollars in today's money to reveal the identity of the woman in the Mona Lisa. And all da Vinci could say is, I cannot tell you who she is. And the reason why he couldn't tell anyone the identity of the woman in the painting is because Mona Lisa is an anagram for Mona Isa. The L stands for Leonardo. Mona Leonardo Isa. My Leonardo Isis. My, that is Leonardo's divine mother. And if you need any additional evidence beyond the fact that it's the Mona Lisa, it's the most iconic woman in Western art, her hands are folded right over left. It's a very esoteric Gnostic secret. But you have in the background the waters and the fires. You have this red lava-like, and then you have the waters. You have the waters and the fires and this S, this winding S lava road, and then there's this rock that separates this channel, this fiery red glowing S from the waters behind. You have the fires and waters of Devi Kundalini Shakti. And the S is the serpent. In the background of the Mona Lisa, he's encoded the fires and waters of Devi Kundalini Shakti. The right over left here, we can explain it this way. You see the Pharaoh in that image? You see that he has right over left? The shepherd's crook is the spinal column, and the, the flail, the whip, is willpower. You also see he has the serpent on the forehead. That's the risen kundalini. And right over left, because on the tree of life, the, the masculine and feminine pillars on the tree of life, you always have the masculine over the feminine, or you have the, um, the divine over the mechanical. You may have heard the expression left-hand path. So it's always right over left. That's related, right? So the fact that the left brain is so mechanical and clinical and materialistic and everything else, right? <laughs> That's why we have the word right, meaning correct. It's not by accident that the two things are synonymous. And left, it's not by accident that the path of the Black Lodge is called the left-hand path. To be or not to be. Right is to be, left is not to be. That's just how we roll. That's just how things, things work out. So that's why it's right over left. Now, the reason why he couldn't, obviously, couldn't tell anybody the identity of the uh, Mona Lisa, because if it would have gotten out that 
Leonardo da Vinci was worshipping the Divine Feminine and had this thing called the Divine Mother and painted a picture of her, he would have been excommunicated from the Catholic Church, which was the Middle Age and Renaissance equivalent of being cancelled. You would lose your livelihood. Nobody could do business with you. Nobody could buy your art. You would be a complete and total outcast. And da Vinci was on the verge of being excommunicated by the church several times, mostly because of his artwork and his works of anatomy. Because very often he would go to the morgues and he would get cadavers to take home with him to study and to, to sketch and to draw so that he could more perfectly understand human anatomy. Da Vinci was one of the first artists to ever do that. Got him into a lot of trouble with the church. So this would have been the nail in the coffin. You will find many other examples of artists, of people talking about their muse, and that muse is always feminine. That's our divine mother. So if you can cultivate that constant remembrance of her, the constant devotion to her, and devoting your life to glorifying her, enriching her, working with her, and expressing truth and beauty and love through her at all times. It's whether you're an artist, whether you're a scientist, whether you're a, a, a handyman, a craftsman, a journeyman, or you're a nurse or a doctor or a lawyer, or you work in the service industry, you can be a plumber, you can be a janitor. It does not matter. Everything that you touch is the body of the divine feminine. Everything that you work with is feminine. Your body is fundamentally feminine. You're working with nature. And if you resolve to see and to remember your divine mother in everything that comes your way, including all the tests and challenges and trials and ordeals, and remember that it's all there for your sake. You find the good in it, you find the opportunity in it, and you look within yourself, one eye in and one eye out, in your self-remembering and your self-observation, and you say, what is it that my Divine Mother is trying to show me with this thing that's in my face and won't go away? What is she trying to show me? This is some kind of a mirror. This is something. And it's bringing up all kinds of negative this and foul that and reactions and everything else. Observe that. Watch that because that's what your divine mother is trying to show you. You may ask, how did da Vinci paint this? How, how did he paint this? And the answer is da Vinci astral projected. He woke on the astral plane. And we've said this many times many times. If you awaken on the astral plane, also known as lucid dream, one of the first things you should do is ask to see your divine mother. Now understanding she can appear to you in any form she chooses, and she might not always appear to you in the same form. But given da Vinci's destiny, she appeared to him with such clarity and perhaps more than once in the same form, and he committed her to his memory so that he could paint her and take her with him everywhere he went. And everywhere he went, where he set up his desk, he hung her on the wall above his desk and or above his bed so that when he slept or when he worked, he could see her so that he would always be reminded of her so that he wouldn't forget. Remember your divine mother. Remember her. It will only bring you good things. It will only serve you. It'll only, it's only a good thing to remember your mother. Leah said, thank you. I really needed this today. You're welcome, Leah.